Now that we understand a refrigeration cycle, let's apply some different scenarios. And the first scenario I want to talk about is going to be undercharge. And when I say undercharge, I want your first thought process to be, there's a leak. And every time I say that, there's always somebody says, but, but Mr. Ty, I come across systems that are undercharged because of the last guy or undercharged because of the installer. And yes, that is a possibility, but it shouldn't be your first thought. Your first thought should be, there's a leak. And now you can go through the process of elimination to see what's going to factor that in. This summer I did training and consulting with multiple different companies across the country. And this one particular person I rode with under six different service calls added refrigerant to the system and not one single time did he do a leak search. And when I asked him about this, he said, oh, well, the last guy always leaves them under charge. It's just the way it is here. And I thought that was quite interesting. So I asked him, how many leak repairs have you done this summer? And he says he's done one leak search, but he has one more scheduled for the fall. So out of all of these systems that he's been working on, he only had one that was a leak and one that was going to come back in the fall. So I asked him how much refrigerant he put in. He goes, I don't know, countless amounts of refrigerant. I said, can you give me a guess how many drums of refrigerant we've gone through? And he said, I don't know, 10 or 20. So 10 or 20 drums of refrigerant, and he just simply assumes that the last person left them low on charge. What I find with my experience is most people don't understand the refrigeration cycle and they overcharge it because they think refrigerant is some magical unicorn juice that just makes cooling happen. So they typically overcharge systems. I don't see it very often to have an undercharged system unless there's a leak. Now, is it possible for an installer to have worked on a system and left it undercharged? Yes, it's possible. But is it not also possible for that installer to not have brazed the lines correctly and there's a leak that he didn't find and it's now leaked out from that time? Is it possible the last service tech left it under charge? Yes. Is it possible that last service tech to have worked in the system and left the leak somewhere and the refrigerant leaked out? Also, yes. So here, by thinking that there's a possibility of a leak first, we can go through the process of elimination. My first thought is to call dispatch. Call the dispatch and find out what the history is of this service call. What's cool is now a lot of service reports, you can pull it up right on your phone digitally and find out the history of what your company's done. So if I go back to the service history and I see that every single person who's worked on this in the past have never added refrigerant, and now I'm on a no cooling call and all of a sudden there's not enough refrigerant in the system, the customer's unhappy because it's not cooling. Well, what happened between the last maintenance call and me coming out? Well, most likely there's gonna be a leak. Or here's another scenario. I go to that same call, I pull up the records, and I see that the last five service techs have added a little bit of refrigerant, a little bit more each time. So is it possible for every single service tech to add refrigerant and also leave it undercharged? Highly unlikely. What's more likely is there's going to be a leak in the refrigerant system. Let's go through another scenario. Let's say I have a brand new customer and we don't have any service history with our company. What I then want to do is bring up a conversation to my customer. Hello, Mr. Jones. We see that the system is low in refrigerant charge and refrigerant doesn't wear out. It only leaks out. Do you have any of your last service histories from this house? And they'll say yes or no or whatever. But if they say yes, you can look back and see what other work's been done. Let's say it's been 10 years and nobody's worked in that system. Well, if it's been 10 years, I'm gonna check that evaporator coil to make sure it's clean. But if it's been 10 years, nobody's worked on it, and now all of a sudden it's low on charge, ding, 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 you most likely have a leak. Or if you look at that service history and you see that every six months or every year somebody's adding refrigerant, ding, 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 there's most likely a leak. See how the leak side of it is your first response. That's what comes up first. Now you can eliminate that. So now that we assume that there may be a leak, we want to present this to the customer. Remember, this is their house. This is their castle. They get to make the decisions. So we go to the customer and have a conversation with them. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, we found that the system was a little bit low in refrigerant, and refrigerant doesn't wear out, it only leaks out. So there's a high probability that there's a leak. I don't know how big it is, I don't know how much of a leak there is until we do a full entire leak search, which does take time. Right now I have your system up and running. Would you like us to come back and schedule for a leak search? Now the great point about that is you don't have to do that leak search right then. You can simply come back at a better time. Maybe it's going to be on the weekend or maybe another person's coming in or maybe it's somebody that specializes in leak searches and they can do it. So you can still go to all your other service calls and they can schedule this in. And some companies even like to come back in the spring or the fall when it's not nearly as busy and do all these other leak searches if it's not a big leak. But it's still going to be the customer's decision. The customer may also want to do this. I would rather run this system and let's see how long it's going to last before it starts cooling again. So if they call back in a week or so, you know it's a significant leak. If they don't call back for another six months or so, it's gonna be a smaller, harder to find leak. But notice how you put that into the customer's court. Now the next question is the legalities of fixing a leak. If it's under 50 pounds, as of the time of this recording, 
If it's under 50 pounds of refrigerant, by law, you do not have to fix the leak. You should recommend to fix that leak. You should try to fix the leak, but by law, you do not have to fix that leak. Now, if it's over 50 pounds of refrigerant, then you have a whole bunch of EPA regulations that go if it's over 200 pounds of refrigerant, under 200 pounds of refrigerant, ozone depleting, climate change potential, all these other factors that go into it, and you have record keeping that goes down as well. But for residential side, if it's under 50 pounds of refrigerant, you don't have to force them to fix the leak. I still strongly recommend that you fix the leak, but it doesn't have to, by law, have to be fixed. So a lot of companies would rather go out and just charge a system, collect the money, and go to the next service call, and they keep coming back, adding refrigerant to that system. However, that's not good if you're not at least offering it to the customer. The customer may not want to make those repairs, but at least you've given them the option and also you've documented it on your invoice. Everything you have, you wanna document that information. So now it's not just the customer saying, well, he never told me. It's documented, they signed off on it, and everybody knows that there's a potential leak in that system. On the other hand, some leaks are hard to find. So if you go out, maybe there's not a leak, you do a leak search and you can let them know, look, the leak is either not here or it's so small we can't find it at this time. And now everybody knows exactly where you stand. It goes down to having options. If it's a large leak, you're having to put several pounds of refrigerant in, you should probably schedule that leak search pretty soon because it's just gonna leak right back out. All right, now that we've gotten that section out of the way, let's talk about what is gonna happen with the system. So we got two different types of leaks we can deal with, with a fixed orbis metering device or a thermostatic expansion valve or an electronic expansion valve, which I put in the same category. We're gonna start off with a fixed orifice metering device. Let's see what's gonna happen. We're gonna start out with a fixed orifice metering device. The more molecules that I put inside, the more pressure I have. And all those little extra molecules are bouncing around against each other, giving us more pressure. So if I have more refrigerant in a system, I'm gonna have higher pressure. And if I have less refrigerant in a system, I'm gonna end up with a little bit lower pressure. So if I have a system that's low in refrigerant, my head pressure is going to drop down. I'm gonna have a lower head pressure. On top of that, I'm also going to have a lower saturated temperature because the head pressure and the saturator are tied together. So where my saturation is taking place, I'm gonna end up with a lower number. It's gonna be closer to the air temperature. So let's just give an example. Let's say I'm at 80 degrees Fahrenheit and my saturated temperature is now at say 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Is there gonna be very much heat transfer? No, there's not because my saturated temperature is too low. So my head pressure is too low, my saturated temperature is too low. I have very little heat transfer overall. So that's gonna be an issue. That lower temperature difference between the refrigerant and the air is going to affect our TD. So our temperature difference here will also be dropping. Also known as the saturated temperature rise. The saturated temperature has it risen very much over the air temperature or you can call it condensing temperature over ambient. Where it's condensing is only one degrees, in this case, above its ambient temperature. So all that number goes down, that's a decrease, a big drop. And now also because we have less molecules of refrigerant, we also have less liquid refrigerant in the system. So our subcooled liquid is going to drop as well, less subcooled liquid. So if we also look at that, let's say we want this much subcooling, but I don't have that much subcooling. Let's say only have this much subcooling. So I don't have nearly as much subcooled liquid. So my saturation's actually taking place way over here and probably more like this level. So I'm very little liquid in there. Because I have very little subcooling, I've dropped my subcooling, I'm gonna end up with what we call a starved condensing unit, not enough refrigerant in that condensing unit. So now we see everything outside is pretty much just dropped down, but we're also, have less pressure in a condensing unit. So that means we're pushing with less pressure on that liquid. So now because I'm pushing at less pressure in that liquid, I'm also pushing less liquid into my evaporator coil. So we figured that there's less liquid in there. I should be all the way up to here with my saturation. But let's say because we have less liquid refrigerant, let's say we're only right about there with our saturated mixture. We don't have nearly as much liquid, but we can't measure the liquid of our evaporator coil or can we? We can measure superheated vapor. So if I measure the superheat and I want this much superheat, but in reality, all of this is superheated. So all of this right here is superheated vapor. So I wanted this much superheated vapor, but I have too much superheated vapor. So my superheated vapor is too high. So if I have a glass and there's too much vapor in the glass, that means there's not enough liquid refrigerant in the glass or in my evaporator coil. 
So because my superheated vapor is too high, that gives me a starved evaporator coil, not enough refrigerant in my evaporator coil. Now because that refrigerant absorbs its heat, it does its magic of changing state from a liquid to vapor, absorbing a massive amount of heat. That's where my B2 is getting into the refrigerant. I'm overall absorbing less B2s of heat. I don't have as much refrigerant to boil because I'm boiling less refrigerant, I'm absorbing less heat. So because I'm absorbing less heat from the air, the temperature of the air coming in versus the temperature of the air coming out is not gonna change very much. Because it's air in versus air out, we call that delta T. So my delta T number is going to be low. It's not gonna have a very big temperature change between the air coming in versus the air coming out. Also, let's think about this. We have less pressure pushing in our evaporator coil, and we also end up with less suction pressure. So my suction pressure is going to go down. I have less pressure in my suction side, which isn't a big deal, except for the fact that our suction saturated temperature is tied directly to our suction pressure. So if our suction saturated temperature drops, now we have something else to look for. What if it drops below 32 degrees Fahrenheit? We know that 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the point where we start to freeze. So because this is below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the moisture in the air, we can start freezing from our metering device, blocking a little bit more airflow, freezing a little further, blocking more airflow, freezing further, blocking more airflow, and eventually, over time, it's gonna take a while, but eventually we could possibly freeze our entire evaporator coil and even freeze it all the way to the outside unit. Now, when you see a system freezing, this 32, you can't just immediately jump in and be like, oh my gosh, that's my problem, it's low in refrigerant. Not at all. In this scenario, we have noticed a starved condenser and also a starved evaporator. We're looking at both sides. And this scenario also includes proper airflow. Anytime you see that saturated temperature below 32, your first thought should be airflow, airflow, airflow. But in this scenario, it's possible. Now I said possible because it depends on the humidity. I had a friend that did an experiment with this. He said he never got it to freeze. When I asked what the humidity was, it was a very low humidity. I had another friend in a very high humid area and he said, yes, it absolutely did freeze up. So airflow, humidity, all these are gonna take a part in it. But I'm saying that the possibility now exists because our saturated temperatures below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So the moisture from the air can start freezing right on this evaporator coil. So that's gonna be an issue. Now, because my saturated temperature has also dropped, my air temperature is gonna be the same or going up, if anything. So let's say the air temperature was 75, my saturated temperature is 32. That's a very large temperature difference. It's gonna be much greater than our typical 35 that we see. So now we have a bigger temperature difference. And just because that evaporator coil is colder doesn't mean it's actually absorbing any more heat. So my, so my saturated of 32 is right here, but overall there's less refrigerant changing state from liquid to vapor, and it's that refrigerant changing state from liquid to vapor that absorbs that massive amount of BTU. That's where the magic of HVAC happens. So if you can see here, it just threw all of our numbers inside completely off the wall. Now, because I also have that lower suction pressure, I have low suction pressure coming all the way back to the compressor, and the compression ratio is gonna be kind of tricky here. Uh, you have lower, suction pressure, we also have a lower head pressure. Your compression ratio is gonna be really irrelevant because you're not moving enough volume of refrigerant. So even if the compression ratio drops, you're not moving very much refrigerant, which is a little bit backwards when we think of compression ratio, but there's not enough volume, there's not enough molecules. The compressor is pumping, but it's not pushing very much because we don't have enough volume in the system. Now remember we said that we're absorbing overall less amount of heat inside? That means we're also gonna be rejecting less heat on this side. So if we look at our delta T on our condensing unit, our delta T here is going to drop down as well because the air coming in and the air coming out, it's all since all the heat I absorbed from inside is all being rejected here, plus the heat of the compressor. So as I'm working on this, I'm gonna see that that temperature is going to be much closer together. The temperature of the air coming in and the air coming out won't have changed very much because I'm rejecting less heat. Think about the heat is in the refrigerant. So if I'm moving less refrigerant, I'm moving less heat. We think about moving heat with the compressor, but also the volume of refrigerant. There's not enough refrigerant here. There's not enough refrigerant there. If I don't have enough refrigerant inside or outside, I don't have enough refrigerant. I'm moving less heat. So the temperature in the house is gonna start going up and our system overall isn't moving as much heat. So we're not effectively taking the heat out of the house and the heat's coming back in the house at a faster rate. So we call this low on charge and ideally your first thought should be find the leak. There are other possibilities, but you're going to eliminate that one first. Now let's think about a thermostatic expansion valve or an electronic expansion valve. If we were really low in refrigerant, we'd actually have all of these exact same scenarios, just like with a fixed orifice. 
But what if it was only a little bit low in refrigerant? Let's take a look at that scenario. Let's say with the thermostatic expansion of, we want 10 degrees of subcooling, but maybe I'm only at two degrees of subcooling. I don't have enough subcooled liquid, so all the conditions out here are going to be the same. What the catch is though, under these conditions, if I at least have two degrees of subcooling, if I at least have a solid column of liquid coming into that metering device, the TXD is still gonna to try to do its job. Let's say its target superheat was this. That's what its target was. That's how much it wanted. And as long as I'm giving it enough liquid under these conditions, it will keep doing its job. So it will keep this much superheated vapor, which means my superheated vapor will be good, which means my evaporator will still be okay, which also means I'll have the correct amount of liquid refrigerant inside of my evaporator coil, which means my suction pressure, my suction saturated is still gonna be the same. Our condenser TD and our condenser delta T is all all going to be the same. How cool is that? It's still gonna to try to maintain it. This is why we don't just look at superheat with a TXV, because we can look at this and be like, oh yeah, everything looks good here, but in reality, I don't have enough liquid in the side. And when the day changes, the condition outside changes, I may end up in a scenario where that TXV tries to open and now it doesn't have enough liquid to do this job anymore. So now these numbers will start to fluctuate. This is why we charge a TXV looking at subcooling first. I wanna make sure I give it the right amount of subcooled liquid. So hopefully it gives you an idea of what's happening between a fixed overs metering device and a thermostatic expansion valve or electronic expansion valve. How that works being slightly undercharged versus being very undercharged.